Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs discusses profit margins in the cattle feeding sector. We'll show you some of the costly challenges farmers face after harvest in Argentina and Brazil. Richard Randall talks about calving preparations. And we'll take a look inside the Nebraska Veterinary Diagnostic Center at UNL. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning and started by asking about the hot streak in cash cattle since we last talked in mid-January. I wish I would have had some more cattle. You always have, you, know, you never have enough when it's good. Um, it's been really good. My concern is that it's run up too far, too fast, and we don't know yet what kind of demand destruction we're doing. Yeah, hamburger's really expensive, like we had been talking about, and you've kept your eye on this for a long time, and the question I pose to you is what happens when the consumer, because at this point it's almost when, when the consumer says I'm not paying it anymore? That, that is a great question. Now, the one thing that's been in our favor, as beef has gone up, so has pork, and the relationship has stayed fairly similar so that that's not really as much of an alternative I guess it's a matter of how much chicken people want to eat how have packer um, or how have your margins been here at the feedlot maybe through the first part of this year extraordinary probably record margins I know it was really good in 2003 um, really good margins because we've had a corn crop price a corn price that you could actually tolerate and you've just had this huge run up in your inventory so it that's the thing that all cattle feeders live for. What about on the other side of that? What's the packer doing? You know, that's been a really great question. And, and the one thing about the packer, and we've talked about this before, you can't figure his margins just by looking at box beef price and live price. That, that, there's no correlation there anymore. They must be doing okay because they keep processing cattle. Um, I think exports are good. And I know exports for the variety meats and the stuff that we would typically throw away they're making money on and they're, they're, they're doing okay. But when it ran up that far, that's, we're way out of line there. So I'm sure that's not very good, but their problem is you're not gonna see an increase in slaughter supplies. And I think they're really gonna have to fight for slaughter, fight for yeah. cattle. When, did that, when does that uh, tightness sort of hit? Well, I think a lot of that tightness, personally, I think we put a low in the cash market here for maybe, I don't know, because we ran into that dead period where demand's not very good. We ran cattle up really high. The, the retailer put the prices in the store much quicker than he typically does. And we had enough cattle around us. Well, now you're gonna go into a period that's typically a dead period anyway, because your yearlings usually get harvested between December and maybe the middle of February. And then you get kind of a dead zone there before you get into the calves. And I don't care when your calf is born, there's very few calves that are gonna be ready to go to market in March. So that's going to get really tough on numbers, I fear. So that's going to be interesting to see if we can drive that price back to the highs and possibly past it. I doubt it, but we're, I think we're going to get a shot at trying it. What do placements look like? And we're talking before the cattle on feed report. That's a great question. I don't think placements in January were that good. We'll find that out. I think in February they've been very good because one of the things you've seen with this big run up in the cattle is you've seen a good feeder fat swap. We're selling 140, 150 fat cattle and you're able to buy break-evens down in the 130s. That's a pretty good swap. You're going to see people go ahead and market their cattle. They're profitable and they're going to go ahead and replace. And amazingly enough, the feeder supply has been pretty good here as of late. Forward question, expectations for corn prices. 
I think corn has nowhere to go but down personally. Now typically you have a, a seasonal that goes up into March and then once planting intentions are out towards the end of March, it starts to leak air a little bit. And then if you have good planting conditions, it's gonna leak a little more. You get towards that June crop and if everything looks good, ooh. And a lot of that corn is in the farmer's hands and that's, that's never good for prices. Do grain farmers buy you dinner often <laughs> at the local bar? No, and they didn't do anything for me when they were getting $8 a bushel either, so. Point taken. What about distiller's grains? What's that market been like? You know, that's still been really tight because, because of the incredible export demand to China. You've still seen a really tight relationship between corn price and distiller's price, so it hasn't been really very advantageous to, to buy a lot and incorporate very much in your ration. Basically, it's just in there as a protein supplement at this point. You're not using it to supplement energy. Next week, Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. Now part three of our coverage of soybean production in Brazil and Argentina. We've showed you in the past two episodes how soybean production has grown in both countries. While Brazil may be the leading producer after its harvest this year, it's already the world's top exporter of soybeans. Argentina is number one in shipping both soybean oil and meal. For both nations, however, some of the biggest challenges occur when trying to sell those products and get them to ports. If the difficulties in these areas are improved, it would have an impact on soybean production there, and therefore, prices here. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money to get soybeans from the fields of Mato Grosso to a shipping port on Brazil's coast. It's the major hiccup in Brazil's soybean industry. You can find some places that are as good as Mato Grosso to grow crops, but you cannot find any place better than here. We have a rain, weather in general, uh, soil, but we have a very serious problem with logistics here. Based on my numbers, I believe that I lose around 25% uh, of my profit just because of poor logistics. With this harvest, Brazil is projected to have increased its soybean production by 76% over the last 10 years. But a lot of the boom has occurred in the country's center-west region, where the transportation and infrastructure are... Really bad. That's really our, our problem in Brazil, because we, we, we increased the production going to the center of Brazil, but we didn't build the, all the infrastructure necessary to deal with that, even to storage the, 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 the grain in there. And that makes people lose a lot of money. USDA data from the third quarter of 2013 showed transporting a metric ton of soybeans 100 miles by truck totaled $9.89. That's on average across the country. If we compare with the with U.S., uh, we have uh, uh, one of our main production costs is logistic. So it's very, it's very expensive. To, to bring the soybeans to the port. The largest soybean growing state of Mato Grosso is a long ways from the nearest port. The distance between Ceriso in its north and the port of Santos is nearly 1,200 miles. It would be a similar distance going from Grand Island, Nebraska to New Orleans. 60 miles to the north in Sinop, Roberto Negrini says trucking his soybeans costs between $2 and a quarter per bushel and $2.85 per bushel. That price is actually better than the state average. At a recent exchange rate, the state average would be $3.23 a bushel during the first three quarters of 2013. The cheapest bill during that period was hauling from northwest Rio Grande to Seoul to the port of Rio Grande at 66 cents per bushel. As one of the first farmers to harvest in mid-January, Roberto also had the benefit of many available trucks, which he says will change once more combines begin rolling. The trucks start to get really busy hauling the grain from the storage facility down south to the port, and then they start, will start to face you know, problems of having, well, we don't have as many trucks as we would like in order to haul our beans out of the field into the storage facilities. Roberto will haul these beans at 16% moisture into the local town elevator. They'll likely then journey south to the ports. The general manager at this port of Santos Terminal tells us the trip from Mato Grosso will take at least three days by truck. It would take six days by rail. A ship here will load in one to two days with either 2,000 truckloads or 1,000 rail cars. The wild card is rain, 
Without a covering, bulk ships can't load in the rain, which backs up the entire process. Compared to the U.S., Brazil's soybean industry is young. To make the entire process smoother, though, it has to invest in better infrastructure. Or it has to find someone else who will. Really, we need a, a more, how can I say, a more clear legal environment in order to get the, 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 invest, the amount of investment we need. Government's not good in that. And you are not going to put your money in a, a, a project that you don't know where it's going to to go, okay? And that's a problem of, I think, legal environment, okay, which is not very clear in Brazil. We don't have the money. We need money from abroad. A silo bag in Argentina. It can store 200 tons or 7,300 bushels of soybeans for up to a year in a producer's field. The silo bag has become a big deal in Argentina, but to know why, you have to first understand why soybeans are planted. Here in Argentina, is, soybean is the star crop. It's cheap to plant, cheaper than corn. It is, um, the yields are very good here. And then we have some quota for selling our uh, wheat and our corn. The government set us an amount that we can sell to uh, uh, foreign markets. The export quotas set by Argentina's government directly influence which crops farmers choose to plant. Last June, the government set a corn export quota of 16 million tons, meaning farmers can harvest the 16 million tons of corn, but once that mark is met, there's no guaranteed price support for the rest of the crop. There is no quota for soybeans, but there is an export tax of 35 percent. The government says that if they keep a high tax on the soybean, they will help us to have um, the food for the people is going to be cheaper. That's the way they, they explain to the people. And people buy it. People buy it. We get angry you know, because 35 percent an export tax is something that doesn't happen anywhere in the world. The USDA Foreign Agricultural Service in Buenos Aires reviewed data from 2009 to 2011 and found tax revenue from soybeans and soybean products brought in about $5.8 billion per year to Argentina's government, or roughly 6% of the average total government revenue. Argentina taxes corn exports at 20%, wheat shipments at 23%, and soybean oil and meal exports at 32% lower than the rate of 35 percent for whole beans. Not coincidentally, Argentina will process more than 70 percent of its soybeans in country. A lot of the oil is used to make biodiesel, a product Argentina leads the world in exporting. It has also imposed a 10 percent biodiesel mandate across the country by year's end. These numbers are set, at least for now. The high stakes game in Argentina is deciding when to sell soybeans not just because the U.S. dollar-driven soybean market can move, but also because the Argentine peso currency fluctuates at an incredible rate. Well, today, if you go, you want to buy a real dollar, the one you can touch it, the green one, you have to pay almost 12 pesos. When I sell my soybeans and they say, your soybean is worth $300, they pay me 6.6 .6 pesos. So it's almost half. So this can last a lot of time because it's impossible to produce that way. We are getting half the price of the dollar. The importance of Argentina's fluctuating currency cannot be more apparent. Inflation last year was 25 percent, and a week after we spoke with Santiago, the value of the Argentine peso fell 20 percent, its biggest drop in a decade. These reasons are why silo bags have become so important. Rather than selling soybeans for devaluating pesos, farmers are opting to hold the crop, and therefore the value, on their farms. Uh, you get paid in pesos, and uh, the, pe the peso is devaluating every day, every day. So uh, the best way of keeping your the value is to keep the, the, the soybean, the grain, and we use uh, bags, big bags, the, to put our grain, and we sell it them when we need to, to pay our our costs, and we try to keep uh, our, our soybean as, uh, as long as we can. According to the latest USDA estimates, Argentine farmers are holding more soybeans than they ever have. 
March 2014 carryover is estimated at more than 330 million bushels. In 2015, Argentina will hold its presidential election. For farmers here, a change in tax policy could impact if these silo bags are more or less important in the future. Our coverage from Argentina and Brazil can be found on our website at marketjournal.unl.edu slash South America. The first part of our reporting detailed the growth in soybean production in Argentina and Brazil. The second described the growing conditions in both countries. On our following episodes, we plan to show you our full interviews with farmers and industry experts in South America. Last week, we discussed the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus with Bruce Broderson, an animal pathologist with the Nebraska Veterinary Diagnostic Center here at UNL. The lab has been conducting more PEDV tests in recent months, but also serves Nebraska by diagnosing other problems in livestock. Curtis Harms has more on the Vet Diagnostic Center. And just a quick disclaimer at the front, some of the footage in this segment is from actual animal tissue samples and may impact your enjoyment of breakfast. Early and accurate diagnoses of disease problems in livestock can make a huge difference in overall animal health. One resource to help farmers in this process is the Nebraska Veterinary Diagnostic Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The center is the only federally accredited veterinary diagnostic lab in the state and has been in operation since the late 1890s. At this center, pathologists, bacteriologists, toxicologists, and virologists analyze tissue samples from living and deceased animals to identify potential disease problems. Alan Doster is the director of the Vet Diagnostic Center. He says the lab serves several purposes within the state. We're here to protect the livestock industry of the state of Nebraska through diagnosis of various uh, diseases, you know, make a diagnosis, allow the veterinarian to know what that diagnosis is and be able to provide treatment. We're also here for regulatory work, primarily for the federal and the state governments. We're also here to provide research material for the various research laboratories. And finally, we're also here to assist in teaching the veterinary students at the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. Each year, the clinic conducts approximately 350,000 diagnostic tests from samples submitted. These samples are from livestock, companion animals such as cats and dogs, wildlife, and even exotic animals from local zoos. David Steffen is a pathologist at the Vet Diagnostic Center. He says one goal of the lab is to provide answers to animal owners. Another purpose of the center is to monitor diseases in the state. We can recognize patterns, emerging diseases. Maybe it'll even be a disease that we recognize, like these enteric diseases in pigs, where we've always seen pigs with diarrhea, but all of a sudden we see uh, more outbreaks that are not responding to current treatments or not being prevented by our current vaccines. And then we recognize something like the epidemic diarrhea virus that just emerged. So we'll recognize new things and help alert the agricultural community that something new is going on and that they need to enhance their biosecurity to take steps to prevent these things from spreading. The lab is currently working on identifying a possible new virus strain in pigs, which is similar to PEDV. We were looking for PED. Our reagents and that weren't picking up any evidence of an, of an infectious agent, even though you know we knew these animals had diarrhea. We performed some very sophisticated tests and actually found another virus closely related to PED virus. The Veterinary Diagnostic Center is funded through a combination of state dollars and sample submission fees. Doster says the lab is vital to Nebraska's agricultural industry. Uh, I think um, this is a wise investment for the state of Nebraska. You know, our livestock industry you know, makes up about 50 percent of our gross um, income in the state. You know, one out of three to four people actually are directly tied to agriculture, and so we're, we play a very um, important role in protecting animal health in the state of Nebraska. Veterinarians usually submit the samples that are tested at Nebraska's Veterinary Diagnostic Center. If livestock producers experience health problems in their herds, they are asked to first consult with their veterinarians. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Curtis Harms. You can stay tuned to Market Journal throughout the year for updates on livestock diseases. You can also learn more about Nebraska's Veterinary Diagnostic Center by visiting their website or by consulting with your local veterinarian. There is now an easy way to dig into soil types and other information about your soil. The February Nebraska Farmer explains how you can do just that with the Enhanced Web Soil Survey. 
You can create your own soil survey for each field and print it out with a cover page and legend. You can find more information at your local Natural Resources Conservation Service or you can read the February Nebraska Farmer. The bulk of calving is around the corner for most of the state. Cows and heifers have been forced to weather a cold winter. Snowfall and precipitation has been more hit or miss. Earlier this week, we talked with UNL Extension Beef Veterinarian Richard Randall near the ARDC in Mead to discuss how farmers and ranchers can be getting ready for calving season. Well, it's always good to have prior planning because uh, when you're in the middle of calving, things can get pretty hectic and uh, get a little bit out of control. So uh, you think about uh, putting a plan together that includes uh, making sure that calving areas are, are clean and are in good working order. Think about uh, putting in maybe an OB kit together that contains all the uh, equipment that you're going to need uh, so you have it all in one place, that it's in good, clean working order. Um, and then uh, actually planning about how you're going to go about the, the whole calving process. Yeah, it's been really, uh, really cold. You're doing some research to look at what that might mean this year for calves and for cows and heifers. Tell me about that. Well, there's, there's several things to consider in that. Obviously, we recognize that in extreme cold, harsh conditions, uh, these calves coming out under severe cold stress uh, are going to have a, a much more difficult uh, time dealing with that. So we want to th make sure that these calves are going to do things like uh, uh, get dried off pretty quickly, uh, get colostrum as quickly as possible uh, and try to keep them uh, a bit out of the draft uh, when, they, when we have it really extreme harsh conditions. Um, in addition to that, there has been some work out there that shows that following long-term extreme cold conditions, uh, calves tend to be a little bit bigger at birth. Um, and that being the case, we don't expect increases in dystocias, especially in, in adult cows, because they can probably handle a five to seven increase in birth weight, uh, but might be a bit different story in heifers. So we always are watching heifers more closely anyway, but this would be a good year uh, to pay particular attention to, to these animals as they go into calving in case we see some problems like that. Related to the cold as well, how about the condition of those cows and heifers? Are they in pretty good shape or uh, is it possible that this cold has also taken a toll on them? Well, obviously when we have these extreme temperatures, these animals need additional feed in order to, uh, uh, to offset those conditions. And so it is possible that these animals, if they didn't get enough supplemental feed, uh, they would be a little bit weaker. And often in those cases we see uh, cows that aren't going to have a stronger contraction because muscles are weaker, they fatigue quicker, and, and therefore uh, the time for them to deliver that calf tends to lengthen. And as it does that, um, that calf can suffer additional stress, can become hypoxic, uh, and when it's born then it's slower to get up, it's slower to nurse, uh, and we recognize that calves under those kind of conditions don't absorb a colostrum as well. So. Uh, there's a number of issues there to pay close attention to and make sure that uh, we're ready to intervene at the appropriate time. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, how are we again for the weekly forecast? Uh, we did see a little weather maker come through the state. It brought a little bit of wet sloppy snow to portions of central and eastern Nebraska. The big winter was Fall City with about a half an inch of liquid equivalent moisture. Most of the real locations were in the tenth of an inch to two tenths of an inch range. Really didn't see much in northern and extreme western Nebraska. We did, did welcome that warmer temperatures, but overall for the month of February so far, we're still running six degrees below normal across northeast Nebraska to upwards of ten degrees below normal in western Nebraska. So even with this warm temperatures, the cold conditions continue and we expect to see another surge of Arctic air move into the northern plains which may impact Nebraska's weather as we move through this next week. So let's get right to the forecast and see what we can expect. And here comes the troughing pattern and we expect the snow to break out across the western part of the state as this cold air tries to shift southward. Looks like the best locations for significant snowfall for tonight through tomorrow morning will be across the western part of the state in an upslope flow regime. Much lighter amounts in eastern Nebraska. It doesn't really look like we're going to see much in the way of significant moisture. Now as we go to tomorrow, we'll notice that cold air kind of stays over the northern plains and we'll basically have these northwest flows, so little impulses will be coming through the flow. Best chance for moisture will be across the western half of the state as we go through Sunday, even with that moisture chances, we're probably looking less than an inch of 
total snowfall. Now, as we go into Monday, another piece of energy comes sliding down, and this one is expected to bring snowfall to the northern portion of the state. Again, really light snowfall amounts in the, in the one to two inch range, but northeastern Nebraska may see the most significant moisture. If this drops a little bit farther south, we could see snowfall totals get up into the three inch range. As we get into Tuesday, here comes another surge of cold Arctic reinforcing air, and this one looks like we may see minimum temperatures as we get into the midweek period, dipping close to the zero degree range across the northern part of the state, and it will not, once again swing a decent shot of snowfall across western Nebraska and northern Nebraska with lighter amounts as you get farther southward. If we go into Wednesday, the cold air shifts a little bit toward the Great Lakes region. We'll see a little bit of a moderation in temperatures before that cold air slides to the east and a warming trend begins on Thursday, but there's another big low coming into the western United States that will start to make its way through the southern plains as we get into Friday, a little bit northern drift, and we will be looking at some significant snowfall accumulations in the central plains. So as we look at the temperature forecast, we do see uh, very much steady temperatures in the, in the 20s to the 30s across the state for the entire period. And in terms of the outlook going forward for next Thursday following Tuesday, colder than normal conditions, and in terms of precipitation, another slug of moisture comes in as we go into next weekend. Thanks, Al. Today's information on cattle markets with Mike Briggs, calving preparations with Richard Randall, and UNL's Nebraska Veterinary Diagnostic Center with Curtis Harms can be found on our website and through our mobile app as part of the February 21st episode of Market Journal. Also on our site at marketjournal.unl.edu slash South America, you can see all of our coverage from Argentina and Brazil. That includes today's feature on the challenges each face in growing their soybean industries. Next week, Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners will be our marketing analyst, and Lauren Giesler will explain the results from 2013 soybean cyst nematode testing in Nebraska. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Whether it's spring planting, fall harvesting, or just a drive across the state, Soy Biodiesel helps a diesel-powered engine operate in a demanding job. Soybean oil from Nebraska Soybeans makes biodiesel a renewable fuel that's also environmentally responsible. The Soybean Checkoff plays a major role in supporting the use and availability of biodiesel. The Nebraska Soybean Board, growing opportunity from the ground up.